I will hand over the proceedings to Penn Faulkner's Elizabeth Gutter and Madalika Sika, who is the author of Breast Cancer Alphabet. She's the executive editor of Mike, a leading news and media outlet, as well as experience with NPR News, ABC News' Nightline. She has won several awards, including Peabody's, Emmys, and DuPont's. So please help me in welcoming Madalika and Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for being here tonight to welcome Hanya Yanagahara. My name is Elizabeth Gutting, and I'm the program director of the Penn Faulkner Foundation. It's our pleasure to partner with Politics and Prose to host this event, and we're ever grateful for their friendship. I'd also like to thank Busboys and Poets um, and their wonderful staff for having us here in Tacoma Park. Literature can be like true love in that you remember the moment a book that will change your life entered your life. Just like you remember those first glances or words exchanged when you meet someone you'll love. And of course, you never know if you're going to get your heart broken. I was introduced to a little life by friends. My colleague at Penn Faulkner, Lily, came into our office one morning breathless over the book, which she'd finished in classic Lily fashion in a single night. Apparently, <laughs> uh, she's a very fast reader. Apparently the night began at 3 p.m. and ended at 3 a.m., but still impressive for what we all know is a very long read. Then my friend Claire, a publicist in New York, described to me how she'd spent her beach vacation in Thailand beneath an umbrella, devouring a little life and ignoring the sunshine and merriment around her. It's the same story anyone who has read this book will tell you, that they couldn't put it down, that they were consumed by it, that it stays with them for days, weeks, and months after turning the last page. I read A Little Life at the beginning of June, intrigued by what I'd heard, unaware of what I was getting into. A classic love affair. I am a slow, deliberate reader, but I did finish it quickly. There's no other way, it seems, to read this book. One night, curled on my couch, I heard myself audibly gasp at a particularly grisly scene and remembered I existed. I'd temporarily forgotten because I could think only of Jude St. Francis, the tortured and brilliant man at the heart of the novel. At first, A Little Life seems to be a classic buildings roman, following four ambitious and pleasingly diverse young men who moved together to New York City after college. There's handsome Willem, an aspiring actor, Malcolm, a soon-to-be famous architect, JB, a first-generation Haitian-American artist who uses his friends as the subject for his gorgeous work, an enigmatic Jude, a lawyer and mathematician whose provenance is largely unknown to his friends, who are drawn to him and protective of him, and who serve as his family since he has none. And it is Jude we fall in love with and try to understand and whose harrowing past consumes us, making those pages turn with anticipation of the most excruciating sort. Much like the book's cover, there's a blurred line between pleasure and pain that goes along with reading it. Hanya Yanagahara wrote A Little Life in 18 months while working full-time as an editor for Condé Nast Traveler. Of writing the book, she told the millions, it felt oddly like being one of those people who adopt a tiger or lion when the cat's a baby and cuddly and manageable and then watch in dismay and awe when it turns on them as an adult. <laughs> that, that sells it. <laughs> the book was nominated for both a Booker Prize and the National Book Award. It is her second novel, her first, The People in the Trees, was hailed as the best book of 2013. It's my pleasure to now turn the evening over to Hanya Yanagahara in conversation with Madalika Sika. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody in here and I guess everybody out in the store listening, the overcapacity crowd who are waving to us. Hi. Um, so I just want to start with a show of hands. Who has read this book? Wow. That's pretty impressive. So we can pretty be spoilery. And anyone outside who we can see? You guys have read the book? Yeah, okay. Actually, then that, this is just like literally being in your book club where your friends actually all did read the book <laughs> as opposed to just read the 50 page, first 50 pages and you just focus on that. Um, so, Hanya, I'm delighted to be here in conversation uh, with you. I have to say, this is one of those books in the aforementioned book clubs that I'm in. It wasn't a book club um, choice that I was in, but it was one of those ones that everybody was talking about in a, 
oh my God, have you read? Um, there is something about this book that stays with people and gets them really, really tied up in it. Um, it's heavy, obviously. It's 800 age pages in paperback and heavier in the hardback, but it's a heavy book. It's a heavy story. It deals with heavy things. And I'm just wondering, where did that come from in your head? Um, we'll get to the writing it in 18 months part later, but just, just where did it come from? I mean, I always want to, well, first of all, I want to say thank you to everyone in Madalika and also Politics and Prose, who were some of the first to get behind this book. And this book's acceptance by a larger audience was not a foregone conclusion, which we can talk about too, for any of you who are aspiring writers, and, and, and I'll be here to disenchant some more. But anyway, I wanted to write a character who never got better. And it's, oh, you can't hear. Can you hear now? Yes. Yes, but there's, there's signaling out there that they, can you hear now? Now you can hear. All right. Okay. I'll try to, to be close I'll try to, to the mic. I'll try to shout a little bit. Um, signal if you can't, Lady in the Green. Okay. <laughs> There's a helpful person in teal there. Um, okay. So I wanted to create a character who never got better, and that one of the things I wanted to do textually was see what kind of suspense and tension could be made in a book in which the redemption narrative never gets fulfilled. You know, we're used to our characters, not only in books, but in movies and in any sort of art, and in life, I think, um, beginning at here and ending here. But I thought, what if, oh, there's, they're waving again. Louder still? Is, okay. This is really unnerving because it's like you're watching, you know when they have, when Ling Ling is giving birth at the zoo, that panda, <laughs> and there's, wait, let me try holding it. Okay. Yeah. All right, that is that be better? better? Okay, that's better, all right. So, so I thought, well, what would it be like to write a character who, who doesn't ever really improve, and can you still find narrative tension, and can you still find a sense of, thank you for moving that, momentum in that kind of story? So that was the first idea. Um, and I had this character in my head for a long time, but it wasn't until I actually sat down and started to write that I realized that I had been working on variations of this character for many, many years. Any of you who are writers in the audience know that the moment before you start writing, before you open up that, that manuscript page or before you set pen to paper, the novel as you imagine it exists in a wide universe of ways. You know, you have a single character, a single idea, and it could prong off in any number of directions. And once you start writing, in a way you're eliminating those other, um, those other possibilities. It's a little, you know, like string theory in that sense. Um, and once you actually start writing, once you commit to that universe, everything else kind of falls away, and that's a moment of mourning in a sense, because it means you're heading down a particular track. So I was reluctant to start in a sense, because there are many different possibilities of who Jude could have been, but I knew at the heart he would be someone who fundamentally never improved. Did you plot the book out, or did it just no, I, come I, out of you? I mean, I think the one thing I do know how to do, and this is because I'm a magazine editor, is structure. And so I knew how it would break into parts. I knew how long those parts would be. I knew what the last lines were. I knew, I knew everything about the construction of the book, you know, the sort of building of the book. Um, I didn't know a lot of other things. I didn't have a lot of facts at, at hand. I didn't know exactly how I wanted the tension points to break at certain points, but I knew that I wanted to do it. And I knew that I had a sort of framework to build upon. It's funny, I wasn't thinking about 9-11 as sort of the most important um, sort of thing that might have happened in contemporary uh, America in the context of this book. I was actually thinking about revelations about the Catholic Church and that if you're living in America during the early 2000s on, um, it was such a you know, huge story. Um, and the idea that, you know, Jude is often triggered, and so I could imagine a scenario where he is living his life and coming across these stories a lot. Um, that, that was the one that, where I thought, hmm, does it, you know, is he even aware of it? Does he see it as something that is relevant to him, or is he so full of blame for himself that he doesn't see it. So I, I'm actually one of those people who 
I think you can write a book about New York without writing about 9-11 because I think what you're writing about, you're not writing a book about New York, you're writing a book about friend, friendships of people who happen to be in New York and we all live our lives very focused on ourselves anyway, so I can see that I mean, happening. I do think the book, I hadn't thought of the Catholic Church um, revelations. I mean, to me, this book, and this is my authorial privilege that I get to say this, this book um, is, is something where the characters are not meant to stand or the story is not meant to stand for anything larger than what they are in the book. And it's, you know, I mean, I can say that, readers can interpret it however way they want, but that's certainly how I intended it when, when I wrote it. Um, and, you know, it is a book that I think is a very New York sort of narrative and a very New York sort of book. Not because, um, you know, I often think it's, it's a book about New York that takes away most of its architecture. It takes away most of its current events. But what I hope it does express about New York is the sense of why people come to New York. And it's because of this ambition. You know, it's because what, what outsiders call the sizzle and the crackle of New York is actually about the collective um, ambition of, you know, several million people squeezed into a very tight space who are there on the run from their families, desperate to create another, and desperate to become something else. And I think that you know, when you have that kind of friction and, and buzz and energy, that's what makes New York New York, and that's what makes this book a New York book. But it's not a New York book because of, because of its landmarks or because of its, its physicality, necessarily. Um, it's a book about men. Right. Um, there aren't a lot of women in it. Uh, it's a book about men written by women, by women, which I am very excited about um, because I think, you know what? Men can write about women and women can write can about they? men. Um, well, they're allowed to. Let's put it that way. Let's put it that way. They're allowed to. Um, I won't digress into a few authors who drive me crazy. That's a whole other conversation. Um, but again, I think that that's a really interesting choice. Um, my staff is a lot of, you know, I work in New York, I have a lot of young men uh, on my staff, some of whom have read the book, and when I told them that, you know, I was doing this, they were like, oh my God, I can't believe you're talking to her, that book is so amazing, and, you know, I want to get the tote bag with all their names on it, everything, and it was just, that book just stayed with me, and it just ask her, how did she... How, how could she write about men that way? And so I'm asking you on behalf of my young men staff, how, and you know, was that even conscious at all either? Did it matter that you were writing about men? Did you start off thinking, I'm gonna write about four friends and did it just happen to be that they were men? Or did you say, I'm gonna write about four male Friends. I started off thinking I was going to write about four male friends. If this book had been about women, it would have been very different in texture and tone and emotionality. You know, I mean, when you are a woman and you have another friend who's a woman, or you're a man and have a friend who's a woman, you are really given permission to talk about almost anything. You can talk about the very mundane, you can talk about the very big. There's nothing as a woman that is off limits for you to discuss. And in no way does discussing, in no way does discussing anything, sorry. Could you check his name, Oh, okay, oh. sorry. Hello, is that better? Oh God, I'm so sorry, pandas. Um, so anyway, I was saying, this book, it's, it's very much supposed to be a book about four male friends. And if it, if it had been about women, it would have been a very different kind of book. Thank you. Um, because women really are given permission to talk about anything. There's nothing that you as a woman can talk about that will jeopardize your womanhood, necessarily. There is a great deal that men are not given great permission to talk about. Um, because men are simply taught when, they, when they're boys that there are certain topics, there are certain emotions that they don't, aren't allowed to access or they're not allowed to advertise or they're not allowed to speak about. And that's true even today. I mean, I'm 41. It was certainly true among the generation of male friends I grew up with and I think it's probably, perhaps to a lesser extent, but still true now. And so I wanted it to, as a novelist, it's always wonderful to work with a group of people who are limited by society in a certain way, either because they don't have full rights or they, because they're, they're not permitted full language or full voice. And when you're working within those boundaries and you're trying to create a set of characters who, are, um, who have been taught by society to be one way 
and are trying to figure out what it is to be another way, that's a great gift as, as, as a novelist, and it's a wonderful thing to be able to do um, within the realms of fiction. Did you, can people hear? Nope. Um, it must be the cord. Okay. Um, did you model that conversation, that relationship, the, the relationships that they had on anyone? Were you aware of, you know, in your life, young men who had that kind of friendship, which, um, which is so close and which is, you know, they're so dependent on each other in so many ways, in a way that I think actually does not get depicted in contemporary fiction or in movies or TV shows. Um, did, did you know anyone like that? I have two very close friends who run in big circles, and they, I'm not the sort of person who has a big circle of friends who has a posse, but they do. And when you do have a friend who runs in a group, who runs in a herd, the, the, the dynamics are particular to that herd. And I have one friend in particular who's been with a group of friends. There's about 12 of them in the circle. They've all been friends since college, and they work terrifically hard at it. Um, you know, no one's married in that group. No one has kids. But what they really do have is this shared commitment to remain friends and to keep the friendship alive. And I found that inspiring. It was it's it, I, because I saw how much dedication and effort they put into sustaining these friendships. Um, and so, although the particulars of the, these characters aren't based on anyone, the dynamic, the closeness um, of the sort of, the sort of mutual dedication to keep going um, and to keep discovering what it means to be a friend, even among people you've been with for 20, 30 years, was inspired by them. I mean, I think what comes across incredibly effectively is what hard work it is to, to stay with your friends through thick and thin, through you know, moments when they offend you or drive you crazy. And um, it, it, it's not easy. It requires a lot of, um, a lot of energy. Um, and I think you convey that so well. And for me, it was refreshing to read that about men um, because I just, maybe I don't read broadly enough. Um, but it's not something that, uh, that I've come across. Um, so I want to talk about Jude and where Jude came from, because, um, I, I mean, I think that the, you know, you talk about someone who doesn't get better and by the time you finish the book, you kind of get completely why he doesn't get better, no matter how lucky and successful he's been that he can't really uncouple himself from before. Um, and was that the starting point for the book, Jude, and then the constellation of people around him? Yes, I mean, at first I wanna say about male friendship that you're right, I don't think we see it a lot in contemporary fiction, but for years it was a topic of fiction. You know, I mean, I, has anyone read um, Vivian Gornick's The Odd Woman in the City? It's really wonderful, right? And one of the points she makes is she's talking about the, the brief and intense friendship that um, Coleridge and Wordsworth had. And she said back in, you know, the, this idea that a friend is someone to whom you confess your deepest, darkest, worst self is in fact a contemporary invention. For many, many years and for centuries, in fact, a friend was someone um, to whom you presented the virtuous self, the best of who you were, not the worst. And I thought, oh shit, I really fucked that up. But, but you know, <laughs> but it, the point is that the idea of male friendship, of male friendship being a sustaining relationship, the one relationship and the first relationship you chose, I mean, when we pick our first friend, it is the first announcement of selfhood. It's of saying, this is my person and this is who I am. Because every other relationship in your life is either given to you or it's bestowed upon you or, you know, you have to do it. I mean, certainly marriage was something like that for centuries, you had to do it for, you know, you know, for political reasons or monetary reasons or so on and so forth. But a friend was someone that you, always got to pick, and that is true in even the most desperate and restrictive of societies. If you have a friend, someone you can trust, that is the one way that you can remain free. Um, but going to Jude, um, you know, I, uh, he was someone who came to me fully formed in a lot of ways because in a sense he was 
very easy to write because his internal logic is his own and it never quite changes. And he tries to get better and he doesn't. And I wanted there to be an inevitability to his life. It's not that I think that that people can't overcome great trauma, but I think for some people there is a line, there is an amount, and they're not able to come back from it. And one of the things I tried to do in this book was really glide a lot between past and present tense. This idea that if you're living with trauma, trauma is not something that happened in the past and then there's a hard dividing line and it's the present. Trauma is something that's waiting in the next room, you know, behind that curtain right next to you. So this idea that you live with trauma every day and some days you can live with it a little less intensely, but other days you can't, is something that I really wanted to try to convey um, in, with grammar, more or less. You know, this idea of, of within the space of a couple of sentences, memories cre creeping back in or, or kind of or falling out, um, to, act, to sort of um, try to mimic this sensation of living with your past when you're trying only to live in the present. I mean, I, I was going to ask you about that, actually, because that, I found that a very, um, very successful device that you, as a reader, you are somewhat experiencing his day-to-day -day navigation of his trauma. Um, things are going swimmingly, and he's got a great job, or he's got a great relationship, lives in a great apartment, and then something happens that, and, and I would imagine that that is how people live through trauma, it never quite goes away. Um, and, and the thing that was interesting to me was that it's, one of the things the book is about is memory and never really escaping it. Um, and you have to kind of come to some, some agreement with yourself of how am I going to live with this memory and how am I going to manage it. Um, but you see that with Jude, and you see that with Willem a little bit um, when he's thinking about his brother. But that notion that, you know, to me it's interesting also if it is, if you think about it as a New York novel, which some do, some don't, I know that wasn't your intention, but you go to a city, you go to start your new life and do new things and be the best person that you can be or the person you've imagined yourself to be, but you can never quite do it because it's always back there. Right. I, mean, I, I mean, I think there's, there's two things that are tyrannical about this particular culture. The first is the tyranny of happiness. You know, this idea that it's all something that we should have. None of us really know what it is, but we're told that we should have it, that it's promised us as a birthright. And, and this, this sort of obsession with something so vaporous, it's like being obsessed with a cloud, you know? And you just, it, but it is, it, it does ruin people in a way. This, it, this, in, this feeling that if you haven't gotten it, if you're not happy, there's something you're doing wrong. And if you don't want it necessarily, there's something else you're doing wrong. And then this idea of memory, the tyranny of memory, that it's something that can be overcome or wrestled to the ground like a panther, and it can't really ever. You can make, a, a friend of mine actually said this very beautifully. She said, some people have to make an accommodation with life. And I thought that was a very nice way of putting it. This idea that your memory is, memory is never something that, I mean, I've never been to therapy, but, but, you know, but that you can really ever, I think, have control over. It's something slippery and vast. Um, and I wanted this book to be about um, this, this, this idea of, of someone who is trying to control and manage memory and feels himself losing against it. And what does that feel like to have to live that every day? The other thing I wanted to do is I think we see memory and we see the facts of our life much differently when, they're in, when we're in our 20s. You know, when you're in your 20s often, the things that happened to you 10 years ago when you were a child, Children accept so much, it's what's given to them. Children are much more accepting of, of, of horrible conditions than adults would be because they don't know any different. You know, you just, you think this is the way life is and then as you get older you start realizing maybe this isn't the way life has to be. But when you get older, you start making more sense of your life and you start putting it into a greater perspective, you start contextualizing it. And that's, I think, for many people when the events of the past really start haunting them um, in a way that, that, that it didn't when they were in their 20s. And so with Jude, I wanted to create a character too for whom his memories and his trauma becomes more and more vivid as he moves further away from it, um, as, he, as he moves beyond those years. 
they, um, confusingly for him, become worse. They do become worse for him, and I think what comes across is this, it's almost like he pinches himself every day, this sort of, I'm, I have this going on in my life and it's wonderful, but somewhere behind me, that hyena or something is gonna come back and get me. Um, and it, it's interesting you talk about this sort of pursuit of happiness, it's enshrined in the American psyche. Um, did you set out to have him try to find happiness? And then as you wrote, it wasn't going to happen? Or was it always going to be just that, that little bit further away from him than he could do? I just don't think, I think he had it taken out of him, the capacity for happiness, for sustained happiness. So among the many things that are quite amazing about this book is the incredible detail and the things that you know, you, you have a sort of facility talking about the law, mathematics, architecture, the movie business, um, medicine, uh, food. It's kind of extraordinary. Um, and it feels very real and very rooted in reality to me. And I'm just wondering the kind of research that you did. I didn't even mention the, the horribleness of what you went through. I'm curious about the research involved and whether you, you know, sat down one day and said, I'm gonna learn all about, you know, pedophilia and sexual assault on young people and then turn that into a book and make all these other things work with it. Because it's very vivid and heartbreaking and when you read it, sometimes you just have to kind of take a breath and stop, but then you read an amazing thing about you know the mathematics professor and the law and what the law is about. It's it's just astonishing to me. Well, thank you. That's really kind. I mean, I can't take credit for all of the professional passages because, as any of you who write fiction know, one of the great sort of unheralded um, privileges of, of writing fiction is it gives you strange permission to call up anyone and say, I'd like to talk to you about your job, and they will. And it's really, they really will, and people are, are wonderful talking about, um, or you'll, you'll be able to call up someone and say, explain this to me, explain what this theorem is, and, and they'll do it. And that was, you know, I really hate doing research, but this is, was, it was a really great sort of two intense months of talking to people about what they did every day. Um, and they helped move the narrative, not hugely, but they nudged it in different directions based on what they said. I talked to the most people for Jude, and I talked to someone at every stage of his career. I talked to a law student. I talked to someone um, working for the US uh, attorney's office. I talked to three litigators. I talked to a law professor, I talked to a clerk um, for a federal judge. So I really got lucky and they were, you know, terrifically generous and helpful in their responses. The math portion came from a very good friend of mine who was a math major at MIT and sat down one afternoon and really explained to me how it worked. And there was such a beauty in the way that he made, um, that he was able to explain math. And I thought it would be the sort of thing that would, I knew Jude would be a mathematician and I knew that kind of, um, way of thinking about life would appeal to him because it is, um, it, it's, it's, it's sort of a wonderful life philosophy. You know, it says, okay, well, here's something. It can be proved. Now figure out how to do it. And it means that it can be proved. And you just have, that there is an answer. You just have to get there. And I, and I thought that for his, he's a fairly literal person. Um, and I thought that it would really appeal to him that, that way of thought. In terms of, the pedophilia, I didn't do any research. And the, you sort of don't have to. I mean, the, the truth is there's a real depressing and devastating sameness to the way that survivors of abuse talk about that abuse. You know, the after effects, the sort of, um, the, sort of the lingering condition of trauma is something that repeats itself in story after story after story. And if you talk to anyone who has been through child sexual abuse, and all of us know someone um, who has, the narratives are very, very similar. 
So it's, whilst he's not based on anyone in particular, I do think that the sorts of things that he um, endures and also how he responds to it is unfortunately um, not typical, but, but, um, but, but not surprising. What kind of research did you look into for cutting and cutting as a coping mechanism for um, Jude? None. And, you know, I was telling my friend who's here that I found out after, you know, it is something mostly women do, and, and women do it because it's, it's the internalization of rage, whereas men tend to explode outward in anger. Um, and, but I thought if, you know, you were someone who had been sort of squashed down by your guardian all this time, it would seem like a very effective method for management on, on Brother Luke's part. So, but many men do do it. I mean, mo many more men than I had assumed do cut themselves. The, one of the interesting fights I had with my editor, and we had a lot, but um, was, you know, that's, you know, that's the next portion, yeah. But, but he really thought that Jude was too talented, that he had too much in his life. Um, and that he had too many privileges, that he had too many talents. And my argument back to my editor was that you can have as many talents as you want, but the talents he needs, you know, which are the right and the way to be angry, you know, to express anger, to be entitled, to, to demand that life offer more to you, are things that he doesn't have. And all he has standing between him and the world is that bag of razors. And I thought, I actually wanted that to be the cover, but they said no. But there was, there, but, but I did think that there is something when, when children are forced to cope and find a way to cope um, with sort of limited abilities and a limited sense of what they can do in the world, the, the things that they have to turn to are very small often and very sad. Um, and I, you know, I wanted you to be someone who was fundamentally never able to outgrow those old sorts of, 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 um, of self-soothing methods. Now you alluded to when we first started to, um, at the top of our conversation about um, how politics and prose, amongst others, embraced this book, and it wasn't it wasn't a gimme at the beginning <laughs> um, that this was a book that would take off the way it did. I'm curious as to, you know, did you write a proposal? Did the editors say, yeah, there's something here, or did you have something fully formed, and then you started to have the fights with them on what should stay, what should go, how are we going to market this book, because um, that's the most important thing. Um, is it a girl's book? Is it a boy's book? Is it, you know, are women going to read it? Are men going to read it? Um, what, what was that sort of process like? And, you know, I've read some stuff from your editor who's you know, just a terrific defender of the great work that you've done here, but I just want to know the kind of fights you had about it. So I was working on this book. My first book was published in August of 2013, and I turned in this manuscript probably around May of that year, so before the first book came out, maybe June. Um, and I was working on it while I was, you know, while the first book was readying itself for publication or being readied for publication. But I wasn't under contract for a second. So, you know, the first book really didn't sell very well. Um, and I, it, it, when that happens, you don't know if the house is going to buy it. So I submitted the book to the, to the editor, Jerry, and he, there's probably radio silence for three months, which is never a good sign. And then I, he was really grappling with the book. And, you know, Jerry is, he's, you know, he's an older guy. Um, and he, I, I mean, I always say that, you know, I've, you know, I have a lot of experience fighting with men in their 60s, you know, my father. But, you know, my father tends to capitulate early and often, and Jerry really dug in. And he said, but it wasn't his type, type of book. I could sense that. Um, but a good editor, a book, good book editor, is really Catholic in their tastes. They're always open for a different kind of read. They're always open for a different kind of book. And that's something I really admire about him. That's not who I am as a reader. But he is um, someone who is able to say about a book, I'm not sure I understand if I even like it, but I'm willing to try. And that's very much what he did with this book. Um, and so it went on and on and on. The first thing he said was, I want you to cut it by a third. And then he couldn't admit, he couldn't figure out where that third would come from. And typically when that happens, you kind of know that the editor is responding purely from a business um, perspective, which is a valid response. The, this is a business, they're there to make money. But you as the writer can either, well, you can do one of a few things. You can say, yes, I'll cut it. 
um, you can say, you can push back, or you can say, I'll leave. And I just didn't have the sense, if Jerry had felt really passionately that the book, that he, if he could point out sections that he thought were extraneous, I probably still wouldn't have done it, but it would have been more compelling argument. But since he couldn't, I finally said to my agent, if they don't want to buy it, that's fine, and I'll, I'll walk away and we'll go somewhere else. And I think that for any of you who are writers out here, you do have this, there's a myth that you don't have a lot of power with your house, and you have a great deal of power. It should be exercised carefully and politely as possible, but it is your book ultimately, and, and you shouldn't feel that you're conceding with your book. You'll never forgive yourself. Um, and that was certainly the case with many of the arguments in this book. Well, I'm sure he's really glad that he couldn't find those sections to cut. Um, I'm gonna open the floor to questions since so many of you have read the book and you're probably tired of me asking all these questions, so I think now's a good time to hear from you all. And there is a microphone that is gonna go around. Um, just raise your hand and the microphone will come to you. You talked a lot about Jude and I'm wondering, I would like to hear you talk about Willem and the relationship between the two and where that came from and your thoughts about that. Well, you know, the book is a fantasy and that's one of the things I had to, you know, keep saying to, to my editor. I'm gonna get to your, to your questions, it's just a long way around. But the book is a fantasy and, and the relationship at the heart of it is, is, is a fantasy of a relationship in many ways. Um, but I wanted Willem to be, you know, I went back and forth with my editor and with my reader about this, you know, was Willem too saint-like? And I actually think that he, if Willem is guilty of anything, he's guilty of being willfully ignorant. You know, you, I, as a reader, I think there are certain points in the narrative when the reader knows more than the characters, and there are some places where the characters know more than the reader. But I hope one of the things that the reader can sense is how much agony Jude is in at certain points and how Willem chooses not to see it, how he chooses to see that life is going to keep unfolding in the way he hopes it will. And I don't think that hope in this sense is, I don't think he's, being callous about it, but I think that hope too it can be a very dangerous thing and it can be something that blinds us to seeing the person in front of us. I, you know, wanted him to be a character who really loves Jude and really um, offers a different sort of way of, of for Jude to see himself even though Jude can never quite see it. But I also wanted to create a relationship that wasn't quite a French, a straight friendship in all senses of the word, and wasn't quite a romance either. And what was it like? You know, I think women have ways of living in that sort of liminal space between a sexual or romantic relationship and, you know, a, a friendship. Um, and again, as women, we can move back and forth, you know, in and out of those relationships very easily. Whereas when men do it, the second they do it, they're gay. And I, I actually don't think of him as gay. I think of it as a relationship between... Um, I wanted it to be about, about two people who kind of had come to realize that they didn't fit into the conventions of any kind of relationship and decide to hang in there anyway. And thank you for your question. So my question is what it goes to, you called it a fantasy, and um, how did you calibrate or recalibrate, you know, the, the lows are the lowest and the highs are the highest and it did almost feel untenable like the higher higher act of that and you know as you were writing and aware of that that you know William Willem not only made a living as an actor but was the biggest actor in the world you know and the artist was at the Whitney you know how did you sort of make the decision that the highs had to be as powerful and right. beautiful as the lows were ugly uh, I mean I I've said this before, so apologies if anyone's heard me say this, but the book is really a, a mashup of two very different genres. It's a fairy tale, and it's a contemporary naturalistic novel. And many of the things that it borrows from a fairy tale, you know, the great suffering of a child, the parentless, the parentless state of him, um, the lack of mothers, the lack of time, the lack of redemption, the sort of um, unsteadiness or, or hollowness of, of a happy ending. Um, are wedded here to you know the way the characters think, the way they move, the what they expect from the world, how they're educated, the sort of language they use, how they spend. That's all the contemporary naturalistic novel. And so when you put those two together, it's 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 not a typical kind of marriage. But one of the things that 
I was able to do within that sort of um, you know, chimeric space is, is have um, a place in which everything was really exaggerated and where every emotion um, was, was sort of turned up to maximum. There's, you know, in contemporary American literature now, I mean, the trend is for very cool literature. It's a little distant, it's a little ironic, it's a little meta, it's a little self-conscious. It, um, it doesn't really, you know, go for the emotions, and that's fine. I mean, it's not the sort of book I wanted to write or was capable of writing. I wanted to write a book that was really greedy for the reader's attention, that really, um, kind of went to the extreme at every single moment it could. And I told my reader, I want this to always feel like a high wire act, as you said, between melodrama and dramatic. And if I tip over into melodrama now and again, I don't really care. But I think in the universe of this book, in which it demands so much from you, and I hope it gives you so much as well in terms of um, emotion and in terms of extravagance and in terms of excess, I hope that it all feels of a part. Thank you, that's so nice. Yes, I, I absolutely love this book. And of course, then I read People in the Tree, and I love that too. And, oh, thank and, you. Yeah. You're one of the, like, the 12 who read it. No one read well, it. There should be at least 50 more right tonight. Thank you. Um, one of the things that struck me is... Uh, the absolute committed uh, quality of the relationship with Harold and Jude, Andy and Jude, Willem and Jude. And we see moments when Jude is capable of doing incredible things. The Alhambra gift to Willem, the bacteria on the cupcakes or uh, pastry for Julia, generally cooking for people. He's able to communicate to others. But other than that, you kind of have to take on faith what he's giving to others to get that unconditional and unqualified love back. It's, it's kind of something I guess you just have to accept. Yeah. And I've accepted that. Other people that have read the book have questioned me about, but I don't understand where that kind of comes from. Is it just a, a guilt with Willem and the younger uh, bro brother? Or are there, are there other things that, that are there and we just kind of need to see them, like uh, the Alhambra or the, the cupcakes? And, I, I think that's a great question. I mean, I, you know, I wanted him to be a character who was lovable, but deeply frustrating and maddening. And you're right, he's not able to give affection or generosity in certain ways in the ways that his friends are able to give him. The things he gets, has to give to them are of the more tangible earthbound kind, you know, gifts or, 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 or food. I mean, you know, which are, you know, ways of, of expressing a different kind of love. But, you know, I think that we all have people in our lives who, where when we really look at it, we don't quite understand what draws us to them. And sometimes it is a mix of pity and frustration um, and guilt. And I wanted there to be a sort of question, you know, is Willem with Jude because of guilt? And if he is, is that fine? And I think it is, you know, I think that, I think that we cleave to people and try to help people for all sorts of reasons. And in the end, it doesn't really make a difference as long as we're trying to do it. There were a couple of times in the novel where you let Harold break out and have a different voice and a different style of addressing the reader, and I wonder if you could talk about that choice and why you made it. Sure. So the narrative, as you know, breaks in three places, and, it, and there's a first-person section from Harold. And, you know, if this book is about a romance between Willem and Jude, it's also about a romance between Jude and Harold. And it is the one point, the three, those three points, I should say, are the three points in the book when, well, first, they're after particularly dark moments in Jude's life. And as you can continue to read, I hope that you feel, the reader feels that he's tunneling deeper and deeper, that Jude is a trustworthy narrative, a narrator, sorry, but he gets less and less trustworthy about himself. Um, and he gets less and less reliable, sorry, about himself. And so it is the one sort of time when you are be able to lift it, you're lifted out of his perspective um, and, and given someone else's voice that stands alone entirely. I tried to do an omniscience for this book that felt like what I came to think of as sort of an intimate omniscience. It's a third person voice, um, but everything is slightly filtered through Jude, except for Harold's parts. And so, you know, it is a kind of jolt out of a world that you feel that you're sinking into, and then all of a sudden you buoy back up to the surface. All right, so 
We have time for a couple more. I want to stand up so you can see me. Um, I don't really have a question. I have more of a comment and a compliment. Um, this was a really beautiful book to read on, on two different levels for me. One, it's just a beautiful story. Um, you're an amazing writer, I, and I'm going to go get your, Thank your you. first book. Um, but also, also as somebody who um, suffers from um, childhood-related PTSD and has been in therapy for 14 years, and I had to almost laugh when you said you'd never been to therapy. <laughs> I was like, this, you tell this story so accurately. You capture what you were saying about um, you know, how trauma never really stops and, and for adults, and, and it, it's still there. It's still something that we always come back to. Um, and for people who suffer from trauma, and, and mine was nowhere near a fraction of what he suffered, um, it's always a gift when you can read a book um, or hear somebody else's story and hear them portray it so accurately and so vividly. It's a, it's a very healing. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you and, and you did it beautifully. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. It's a wonderful compliment. Thank you. Hi, I thought your depiction Hi. of JB's drug addiction was just so spot on, um, but it also seemed like maybe a fun part of the book to write. <laughs> Yeah, I was. I mean, I really love JB. He's the character who's probably the most like me. And he gets all the best lines, you know? And he, that episode was one of the few things that I did draw from the life of a friend of mine. Um, and, but he is a character I really love, and he is the character who changes and grows the most over the course of the book. I mean, the others remain fairly fixed. Um, and he's the one who I think struggles the hardest with what friendship is and how to be a good friend and how to be a good person. I mean, for most of us, it doesn't come naturally. Um, and it is a lifelong struggle to try to figure out what it means to be a loving person to someone else. And I wanted him to, to, to have that struggle. All right, I think one more question, the last one. I actually have two really small questions. The okay. first one is, did you cry at any point when you were writing this book? And if so, where? <laughs> and second of all, on the subject of JB, I really loved him as well. And I was wondering in the beginning, do you know what his inspiration was behind his hair projects? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I did not cry. Um, and I, I, in fact, my first reader didn't cry at all. And my agent didn't cry, and my editor didn't cry. So when people started crying, I thought, wow, what a bunch of pussies, you know? But, um, but no, none of, none of them cried. I mean, they're, either everyone is weak or they're dead inside, you know? So I think it's, I think it's the, the latter, that they're dead inside. Um, but thank you. Um, you know, I, I had this very clear idea of what... I kind of thought that the work would be a little... I mean, that, it, you know, it's young work that he's doing, the hair pieces. Um, and so by nature, all young, well not all, many young visual artists work is very derivative. I mean, all young artists work is derivative, that's how you start. And the problem with writing visual, about visual projects as a writer, is because you can't think that way, you basically are stealing nonstop from various sources, and I stole a lot of different art from other people um, to write this book. But I thought it would be a little Merritt Oppenheim, I thought it would be a little Lorna Simpson, I thought it would be, kind of have some sort of, you know, a little bit of, you know, a Carrie Mae Weems kind of feel. So I stole from a lot, and I thought, you know, he's a smart young artist who, um, who is trying to make the sort of work he feels he should be making. He would be borrowing from sources that were a few generations older than he and trying to make it new. Um, but, you know, I loved writing JB, and, and, and as, as you said, he was the most fun to write. Um, not only because he's the most earthbound in a lot of ways, but because the projects he's doing are, um, are things he's passionate about and they also are a way that, you, that I wanted to chart and move into adulthood, how an artist becomes, how a creative person becomes, grows into themselves and grows into their own vision. And technically it's 7.29, so one more question. Um, I love book covers, and I just want to say this, the cover of the hardback, at least, is astonishing. Can you speak to the moment you saw the image? And finally, have you finished the next novel? <laughs> um, thank you. I, the, 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 novel, the, cover on the, the image on the cover is called Orgasmic Man by 
a photographer named Peter Hujar, who was part of the downtown New York East Village scene, you know, with David Wojnarowicz and um, Robert Maplethorpe and Keith Haring and, and on and on and on in the 70s and 80s. The picture was taken in 1969. I recently found out from Hujar's executor. Hujar died in 1987 of complications due to AIDS. And the man in the image is someone named Dutch Anderson, and there's no information on him. The, the estate doesn't know if he's alive. They don't know who he was. They don't know, you know, they don't know anything about him, which is a great story in and of itself. But I saw this image, a friend of mine reminded me of it when we were looking for cover images, and I thought it was so, I'm looking at it here, which is why I keep looking down, but I thought it was so wonderful because I thought, A, you couldn't tell whether he was in pleasure or in pain, but you knew that you were trespassing on a very vulnerable moment for someone, and it was unbearable to look at. And I hope that it echoes the experience of reading the book as well, that you are violating someone's most intimate moment. Um, and in that sense, um, I, I thought it was the right cover. How about the next book? Oh, the next book, I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> none. Well, Hanya, I want to, again, congratulate you on quite an amazing, um, amazing book, and thank everyone for coming. And I just have to ask the gentleman in the back with his T-shirt, because when I tell my staff member that I saw someone wearing a T-shirt like that, he's going to be, where did you get it from? So I will come and ask you later. Oh, you made it. Awesome. Um, so congratulations, and thank you.